Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everybody. And thank you for joining us in this session under the title of Eastern Mediterranean Region Collaboration on the Online Training for the Primary Care Context of the COVID-19. My name is Hassan Salah. I'm the Regional Advisor for the Primary Health Care and the Team Lead for the Access to Health Service in WHO Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office. And I'm the moderator for our session today. Our agenda today will start with a brief introduction and a short video about the online training, followed with two presentations. The first one is about the training design, and the second one is about the evaluation of the training impact. Then we'll have around 15 minutes panel discussion to answer three questions. We'll close the session with a take home short message from all the, our distinguished speakers. As an outline of the training, and as you already know, at the beginning of the pandemic, especially during the first wave, the health system was towards mainly the hospital care and completely ignoring the primary health care four functions which including the first function is maintaining of the delivery of the essential health service. This is the most important function. Second, the dealing with the prevention of the COVID infection. Third one about the assessment and diagnosis of the COVID. And the last function is about management of the mild and the moderate cases. To disseminate this four function, we work it with our partners for the primary health care. This is including Wonka, UNICEF, UNFPA, UNAIDS, UNHCR, and recently our colleagues from the Arab Board of Health Specialization. And we developed an online training under the title of Role of the Primary Health Care in the Context of the COVID-19 Pandemic. The online training, it is fully automated with four languages, English, French, Farsi, and Arabic as well. And so far, we are in continuous updating it every couple of months, and it is available on mobile application. And it is accredited by the American Association of Continuous Medical Education with 15 accredited hours and endorsed by the Arab Board of Health Specialization. This online training actually presents one of the most successful experience in terms of the collaboration with our partners dealing with primary health care in our region for the Eastern Mediterranean region. Over 90,000 participants, and I mean by the participant, this is the primary health care physician registered for this online training. I will show you something like 90 second infographic about the outlines for this training. Karim, can you please display the video? Thank you. Robust, accessible, and universal primary healthcare is critical for responding effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic. A new online course is now available to help ensure that primary healthcare is fully integrated into the COVID-19 response in every country of the Eastern Mediterranean region. The World Health Organization, UNAIDS, UNFPA, UNHCR, UNICEF and Wonka worked together as part of the Global Action Plan for Health and Wellbeing to create this innovative training. The course covers the four main functions of primary healthcare in relation to COVID-19. Maintaining essential health services, preventing COVID-19 by supporting effective public health measures, early detection of COVID-19 cases and ensuring adequate referral, and managing mild and moderate COVID-19 cases. Participants will receive certificates of completion from WHO, accredited for 15 study hours by the American Association of Continuing Medical Education. If you are a primary healthcare physician working in the public or private sector in the region, we strongly encourage you to complete this training. Thank you. We'll start the first uh, presentation for Dr. Saeed Suleiman. Dr. Saeed is a WHO MRO consultant on the family medicine. The video for Dr. Saeed, please. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for this excellent introduction. And thank you for the Wonka um, organizing team for this invitation. Also, thanks to our dear panelists who are attending with us today. In the next minutes, I will provide an overview on this training course on the role of primary health care in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. The talk will cover the instructional design models used as well as the modular plan and structure, uh, as well as the sources for course creation and the timeline of course production and the lessons we learned either from the user's data and feedback or from the social media campaigning. For this training, we relied heavily on the very well uh, known or popular ADI model, which starts by analysis of the learning needs, then design of the instruction and development followed by implementation and evaluation. But we also make use of the SAM model, which is the uh, successive approximation model, which um, allow us to have early feedback while we are creating modular structure or small units of the course. We also relied on the backward design that start by identifying the learning outcomes or the results we want to achieve with our students and based on this, we design our assessment models, are either formative or summative. And the last step is instructional um, design or instructional learning experience and instructions. In the analysis phase, we identify the learning outcomes as well as the target audience as well as the modality. The target audience for us were frontline PHC workers, mainly physicians we started or we uh, selected that the course will be online. Online is more learner-centric, excellent adaptation for the shift for education after the COVID pandemic. We also um, decided that the course will be, will be asynchronous. And this was chosen over synchronous modality because it allows students to be at their own space uh, or pace and also, it allows multiple cohorts of students. With a synchronous modality, we cannot reach the number we reach it with this online training. We choose a model as the learning management system, and we choose in uh, Articulate 360 as content management system or authoring tool. We relied also on the backward design, and we um, prepared modular plan as well as we identified the course content sources and we started building our teams and we set a timeline for completion of this course. In the design phase, we, uh, we put the scope of our project as well as the teams. This uh, course has been produced by a uh, success and successful interplay of teams. It started from the UN organizations and Wonka the subject matter experts, the content reviewing teams, the instructional design team, the information technology team, the design, the media, and the infographic teams, communication and branding, social media campaigning teams, internal and external evaluation, as well as the impact evaluation teams from the American University in Beirut. For module one and two, which focus on the continuity of primary care, we designed this modular plan, including what is the module number, what are the learning objectives, what are the topics and tasks and procedures required for that, what are the content and how are they taught, and what are the assessment methods. We also identified the sources for these modules. For module two, which focus on COVID-19 prevention and education, we also provide this learning modular plan as well as the sources. For module three, which focus on the safe clinical assessment and diagnosis and categorization of COVID and suspected COVID patients, we also uh, produced this content modular plan as well as the sources. And for the last module, which focus on the role of primary care in COVID-19 management, we provided this modular plan as well as these sources. In the development phase, 
we, we created this timeline for content development. We started by April 2020 with consultations internally within the WHO team led by Dr. Hassan Salah on the concept and scope of this training. Then after that, we selected the IT company and we identified the technologies we are going to use. We started by building the outline and modular plan of the course and uh, we did internal and external review of this outline as well as the sources. By May 2020, we started consultation at the regional collaborators and we started preparing some course sessions content and we have now overall course review by collaborators as well as we started communicating this content to the IT company to start piloting and content development. By July 2020, we started the course session content finalization by the IT company. The communication team worked on the design, the look and feel, the banners, the videos of the regional directors endorsing the training, as well as infographic video for this training. By August 2020, we finalized the course content. The co course content underwent internal and external review and feedback, and this review and feedback has been reflected back to our course. We started by the end of, July, of August 2020, a pilot launch of the course to test the uh, any IT um, problems and to test the platform. By 6th of September 2020, we conducted a very successful launch of the course with the attendance of the regional directors of the collaborating organizations as well as ministers of health from states in the region. You can see uh, in, down on this timeline that uh, in the first two to three months, we have consultations within WHO and then started the regional collaboration and IT team uh, production, and later on internal and external evaluation. This included a weekly meetings and workshop to make these things done. Post-launching, we focus on providing a continuous IT support for the users of this training, and we have a plan for multilingual considerations, we have a plan for promotion for the training in the region, we have a plan for frequent update of the content as well as evaluation of the impact of the training on the providers. This is the timeline of post-launching activities started by October 2020, 2020 by consultation uh, in the editorial office and translators to prepare for Arabic, Farsi, French translation, which has been started finalized by December 2020, and we have by December 2020 the first update of the course to include new information about emerging vaccines. We have also planned for social media promotion by December 2020. By January 2020, we prepared social media campaign plan as, as well as the assets needed for this targeting. And we also planned for training evaluation impact exercise that Dr. Mona will present after me. By May 2021, we have the second content update with new updates in the management, in the vaccines and rehabilitation. And we did data collection for course evaluation. By October 2021, we have the final report of the course evaluation. We plan changes in the course content and the IT infrastructure based on this evaluation exercise. By November 2021, while we are talking now, we have more than 90,000 participants in this training. These are um, images from the social media creatives used for promotion of this course. And how this social media affected the user registration is illustrated in this graph. We now that you know that pre-launching, we have almost like 300 users uh, in the day of launching, these are the pilot users. By the first week, we have more than 1,000 registration, and you can see the curve of the registrations have two peaks of increase. The first peak is by um, March, April 2021, uh, where the first social media campaign started, and actually the registration jumped from um, 24,000 participants to above 55 participants. And by um, August, 
August, September 2021, we launched a second uh, social media campaign, which raised registration from 70,000 registration to more than 90,000 registration. How the training looks like now? It looks like it have five modules covering the four main function of primary health care. It's self-registered, self-paced, fully automated, available in four language, English, Farsi, Arabic, and French, available on the web, mobile apps for model as well as tablets, almost updated every two months. The certificate is accredited by the American Academy of Continuous Medical Education and endorsed by the Arab Board of Health Specializations. We have more than 90,000 participants, as I mentioned. This is the link to join the training. The uh, last phase of the ADI model, the uh, ADDIE model, we um, adopted for a production of this training is evaluation. It is the most easy part to miss, but we didn't miss, we conducted um, uh, either on course evaluation, so the course ends by obligatory evaluation form that cover the initial reflections and feedback of the students or the participants, as well we did um, a separate uh, evaluation exercise that has both quantitative and qualitative methods for assessment of the impact of the uh, of the course on the primary health care provider. Dr. Mona will um, kindly provide presentation on that after me. Thank you and any questions. Thanks a lot, Dr. Saeed. The second presentation is for Dr. Mona, and it is about the evaluation of the training impact. Dr. Mona is assistant professor of the family medicine and the medical director of the family medicine clinics in the American University of Beirut. The video, please, for Dr. Mona. <music> Uh, good morning. Uh, so I will be presenting today about uh, the evaluation methodologies and results of the uh, WHO online course on COVID-19 pandemic. So by now, I guess uh, you've heard already about uh, the course design and the course content. So I'll be focusing mainly on the objectives of the evaluation, the methodology we use, the results and any limitations and finally conclude, have some concluding remarks. Uh, so uh, the evaluation mainly uh, aimed at assessing the perception of trainees regarding the content design and delivery of the course, and also to assess the impact of the course on their knowledge and the attitudes and practices, and to see how did that impact, uh, you know, uh, their behavior uh, in, and their practice in, the, uh, in their organizations, and if they made any changes in their organization and at the same time uh, to develop recommendations for the course improvement. So uh, for that, we relied on the Kirkpatrick framework, which assesses usually uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, impact of uh, any training uh, uh, course or any training curriculum. And it has mainly four levels for assessment. So level one, which is the reaction, it assesses the trainee's satisfaction and the trainee's experience with the course. Uh, or any training program, uh, level two or the learning to assess what they have gained uh, in terms of knowledge and skills and how did their attitudes change. Level three or the behavior to see how did uh, this course or this training material change their practice and behavior on the ground. And also uh, the final level or level four, uh, it assesses the, this is to measure or evaluate the ultimate impact of the training. And uh, it refers mainly to the effects of the training program on the trainees broader area of work, which means uh, uh, really the changes that they will make, for example, in policies and procedures, or also at the same time to assess the impact on the outcomes, uh, mainly, for example, on patients, uh, on cost savings and et cetera. So to do that, 
uh, we, uh, we conducted a cross-sectional study uh, during the period extending from March to July 2021. And we gathered the, the information using different modalities, mainly uh, the WHO MRO online platform, that what, whatever uh, information available there regarding the course. Second, uh, a quantitative assessment uh, uh, through Lyme surveys that were sent to, to uh, participants who completed the course and those who did not complete the course. And finally, a qualitative assessment uh, through conducting in-depth interviews with, uh, um, with uh, a group of uh, trainees, uh, uh, WHO, MRO uh, directors, uh, course directors or leaders, and other partners and stakeholders. So uh, we used the uh, SPSS uh, for data analysis for the quantitative data and also uh, thematic analysis for the in-depth inter interviews and we did a triangulation of data at the end. So the results. Uh, so by July, uh, by July 2021, a total of uh, around uh, 72,938 registered in the course. The majority, 94%, are uh, from within uh, the Eastern Mediterranean region, and uh, the majority of them are from Qatar, Pakistan, uh, followed by Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, etc. Um, the enrollment uh, changed really uh, with time. So we had for we have for the different uh, languages of the course, but we had two peaks mainly. Uh, for the English course, uh, uh, the beginning at the launching of, of the course in September, and uh, also uh, around March uh, with the Facebook campaign that was launched at that time, where we saw uh, an increase in the uh, uh, enrollment in the four uh, courses at that time. However, uh, the percentage of completion uh, per enrolled participants was not that high, uh, so only uh, 40 2% uh, of those who uh, enrolled uh, in the course completed the course effectively. This was in April, and also in July, uh, the number increased to 46%. Uh, uh, just to mention that almost 50% of those who enrolled, uh, who registered in the course, uh, enrolled effectively. Uh, uh, for the uh, evaluation analysis, we uh, used the data from the, the different uh, you know, modalities that uh, we use to collect the information. So uh, we had uh, around, uh, for, we analyzed around 14,602 responses through the course immediate feedback that uh, each participant uh, fell at the completion of the course before getting the certificate. And also for the quantitative Lyme survey, we uh, around 1,204 filled the survey fully and uh, with a response rate of around 85.4% among those who accessed the survey and did not refuse to complete it. And for those who did not complete the course, a total of 1,051 uh, filled the survey fully with a response rate of 80.9%. And for the qualitative uh, data, we did a conducted in-depth interviews with 21 trainees, uh, members of WHO, MRO team, and other partners. So uh, just to mention also in the beginning that uh, in the Lyme survey, uh, uh, it showed that uh, uh, medical doctors constituted around 22.6% uh, and 30.4% among those who uh, completed and did not complete the course. And the nurses or midwives uh, also constituted 48.3% and 26.8% of uh, those who completed and did not complete the course, uh, which means that uh, almost 50% uh, are not uh, doctors or nurses among those who uh, 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 enrolled in the, uh, uh, in the course. Uh, and also uh, comparing other characteristics, so the majority of those who completed the course were from the EMR region, uh, and they did not have the majority of them also, they did, they, uh, they did not have any administrative uh, role, they were mainly really uh, practicing uh, clinically. Uh, we will now, I will now mention uh, regarding the uh, results of the, based on the Kirkpatrick, uh, you know, framework. So at the level one, which me measures the reaction, uh, the evaluation of the course uh, by trainees was, was uh, positive. 
they were most of them were satisfied with the content of the course the learning aids the assessment tools and the online platform as it shows now in the uh, next few slides so this slide it shows the uh, their satisfaction level uh, from the course immediate feedback and immediately this is among the 14,000 plus who completed the course so uh, as you can see that uh, uh, a great majority more than 80 percent almost uh, were 87.5 uh, percent were satisfied with the learning side and platform 83.9 percent were very satisfied with the learning aids and etc and this was also reflected in the Lyme survey in the uh, that we conducted among those who completed the course. So as you can see in the last column, so for for the majority, the great majority of them, they were satisfied with the with the knowledge uh, provided, with the information provided, and the modalities of the training. Uh, also, as an overall satisfaction uh, regarding the uh, the course, uh, ninety six point four percent were either satisfied or very satisfied, and 97.3% would recommend the course to others. And also uh, for uh, rating the online learning experience, 46.3% rated it as excellent, and 49.3% rated it as uh, good. Th these are a few quotes from the quantitative uh, you know, study that we did or the interviews that we conducted. So as you can see, um, uh, they said that the course was comprehensive from start to finish. It was straight to the point. It provided particular guidelines to the situations, uh, 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 primary care physicians or the healthcare providers were facing. And uh, also uh, the last one they mentioned what's great about this course is that it collected all the needed information and guidelines in one place. Uh, having mentioned that, this does not mean that there were no challenges. So there were some challenges that faced the uh, uh, participants um, uh, who completed the course. So uh, there were technical challenges. 9% reported technical challenges that included mainly slow internet connect connections, inter frequent internet cuts and uh, electricity cuts and etc. And also uh, there, were, uh, there was uh, some challenges because they did not have response or feedback on some of the questions maybe that they had in their mind. Uh, as mentioned in this quote, sometimes when you are taking the course, you have a question which you would like to be answered. And this does not really happen in this course. And uh, also uh, to proceed with the technical difficulties, they were the main uh, cause for not completing the course. Uh, as it can be seen here in this slide. So technical difficulties uh, were um, uh, faced by 26.5% of those who did not complete the course. And this was the main reason for not completing the course. Uh, it's worth mentioning here that uh, among those who did not complete the course, 55.1% mentioned that they are planning to do to so because wh when we uh, sent the uh, uh, Lyme survey at that time, uh, they were, uh, you know, they were in the in the process of completing the course at that time. Uh, uh, also, uh, for participants, they had uh, some suggested changes, for example, like adding more related topics and updates, uh, adding animated videos, uh, and also to make one video for each module uh, instead of multiple videos, uh, and to add more infographics, more illustrations, and etc. Uh, also, uh, it was suggested to add more interactive tools. Uh, this, is, this was suggested by 47.5% of those who uh, responded to the uh, survey that we sent among those who completed uh, the course. And, uh, uh, you know, they suggested, for example, having polls, having chats, and also having an interaction with an instructor. This was mentioned by around 63% of them. So uh, other suggestions is to have more targeted course depending on the participants' professions and also to make modifications to the platform to make it more user friendly. So I'm adding in each slide, if you can have the time to read, some of the quotes that uh, back up uh, also the results of the, uh, you know, of the uh, uh, quantitative uh, surveys. Uh, level two uh, of uh, the Kirkpatrick level two, uh, which measures usually, uh, you know, the change in knowledge uh, or the extent of knowledge or change in knowledge and skills that the trainees had. Because we did not have a pretest and post test, uh, you know, there was no pretest, uh, in, you know, when they start the course. So what we did is that uh, we, we did a comparison between those, uh, the change in knowledge between those 
who completed the course and those who did not complete the course. And uh, we uh, added in the survey 21 questions uh, that cover topics that were included in the course. Uh, these are the questions. And uh, the analysis showed that uh, only for medical doctors, uh, there was a significant change uh, among yani, uh, comparing those who completed the course as those who did not complete the course. This was significant. And also uh, respondents who did not have an admi ad administrative post had significantly higher scores than those with an administrative post. And among those who completed the course, it was the medical doctors who had a significant higher scores as compared to the other uh, uh, respondents. Uh, at the, the third level, with, which measures the uh, change in behavior, uh, so also we could not do, uh, you know, site visits and, uh, uh, you know, uh, see the change in behavior, but we relied on their perceptions and what they reported, whether in the uh, quantitative or qualitative uh, surveys that we uh, conducted. And uh, a good percentage of the trainees reported that they felt more confident in the care provision uh, that they would perform and that they would perform better. Uh, so as you can see here, um, this participant mentioned that uh, this course increased our confidence, it boosted my confidence and my knowledge. And uh, also uh, when they asked about changing their practice behavior, around 33.6% stated that they are very likely to do so, and 51% stated that they are likely to change their behavior. And in fact, um, uh, many of them uh, reported in the uh, quantitative interviews that they uh, changed their behavior, uh, whether in the use of PPE or in the, uh, you know, in changing some of the practices on the ground. The last level of the uh, Kirkpatrick, we again relied on what trainees reported as changes made to their workplaces and the healthcare team in general. So 79.3% reported that they were able to educate their colleagues. Uh, so for example, as this participant mentioned, I have educated my staff nurses on what protocols to follow. And I taught many things that I learned on the course, in the course. And 82.1% of the trainees who filled the online survey reported also that they implemented some changes in their organizations. And these changes included, for example, uh, use of PPE in work, this was the most common change. Uh, some were able to change policies and procedures, uh, you know, to, um, uh, to do some changes in the work environment to make it uh, safer, etc. And uh, uh, almost 38.8% uh, did not encounter any challenges while implementing change in, changes in their institutions, while others included yeah, faced some changes, mainly, for example, lack of resources, lack of time, uh, some system related uh, 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 challenges, but uh, it's worth mentioning that 58.1% also of those who did not make changes were planning to do so in the coming period. So uh, these are a few quotes of uh, the changes that uh, they were able to make in their institutions. For example, uh, some uh, one of them, uh, one of the uh, respondents, the hospital entrance, uh, others mentioned that we changed the setup of our healthcare establishment and the way we receive patients and the method of practice. Uh, a, a third one mentioned that we implemented the guidelines of the course, uh, which were different from the national ones, so they took that risk, but at the end, the, the country, the ministry uh, changed their guidelines and adopted the WHO guidelines. And we changed uh, a fourth particip another participant mentioned that we changed our practices protocols, how should the patient enter, how should we protect ourselves, and etc. Uh, also, as part of the evaluation, we did a technical evaluation regarding, uh, you know, the registration process where some pitfalls were, uh, you know, were identified, uh, whether at the level of the reg registration, enrollment, uh, contacting patients, and uh, also uh, there was uh, no uh, continuous support to participants for any queries or technical difficulties. Uh, at the marketing level, uh, it is worth uh, noting that WHO MRO followed different strategies to promote the course in the region, including lobbying with high health authorities, including communicating with WHO uh, national or local offices, country offices, and also uh, at a later stage through the social media. 
So uh, there was a difference in the enrollment of, uh, you know, of the different countries, which can be due maybe to some communication or maybe administ administrative directions at uh, the local level, where in some countries, maybe uh, it was mentioned that uh, 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 it was considered as part of the continuous professional development that uh, healthcare providers, uh, you know, uh, the points that they need to earn to renew their, uh, uh, their license and etc. So they were more uh, encouraged to receive, to take that course, especially that there are CME courses that they will get at the end. And uh, maybe other uh, condition, other uh, uh, contact again, other uh, issues can be related to the uh, maybe internet, uh, you know, cultural factors and social factors, uh, etc. And also the course was promoted through the trainees themselves because as as they mentioned, 82.7 percent of the trainees stated that they recommend that they are very likely to recommend the course to others. And um, it was mainly the social media, the Facebook and Instagram uh, uh, marketing that really boosted the numbers, although this was not translated at the end in a huge difference in those who completed the course, but there was a difference in the number of uh, those who enrolled and, uh, you know, uh, were exposed to the content of the course at the end. There were some limitations in our study. First, a recall bias, because around the more than half, they completed the course before March 2021, when we uh, sent the surveys. Maybe there was a selection bias uh, in terms of um, maybe those who uh, wanted to, you know, to express their opinion, they filled the survey. Uh, this was mainly for the quantitative uh, survey that we sent to emails. And uh, there was no uh, a pretest, so we had uh, to resort to comparing uh, the results in, uh, among those who completed and those who did not complete the course. And also, we were not able to uh, really have uh, conduct the observations uh, in the workplaces. Uh, and we not, were not able to uh, gather outcome indicators, which are essential component of the level four uh, of uh, Kirkpatrick uh, framework. But in conclusion, we can say uh, that um, the analysis of the different methods uh, showed that uh, the course was well designed and well received, and we had the really comparable results uh, from the different modalities that we used to uh, extract data. And uh, the course was the, the first uh, uh, experience in develop for WHO EMRO in developing, hosting, and de delivering a fully online self-paced training course. But it was a, a very successful experience uh, from the perspective of the participants and uh, also from the perspective of the partners. And also it was a decision, a good decision for WHO EMRO to partner with, uh, you know, with international agencies, organizations, and academic or authorities in this uh, course, because it was uh, really uh, one site where uh, uh, all uh, unified guidelines regarding COVID-19 uh, was available on one uh, platform. Uh, and also it had, of course, promotion of the course through the networks of the different partners. So uh, finally, the comprehensive evaluation of the course based on Kirkpatrick model showed a high rate of satisfaction of the trainees regarding the content, training instructions, and training platform. It showed that it was also effective in improving the knowledge, especially of medical doctors. And uh, a high percentage of the trainees uh, who completed the online survey reported that the way they were able to make changes uh, in their behavior and in their organizations as, as well. So uh, we can uh, safely assume also, as I mentioned before, that the results are credible because we had really comparable results from, uh, from the different modalities that we used. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mona. It is really a great piece of work. I mean, uh, developing and disseminating of this online training in itself, yes, it is very important for us. But more important is to measure its, uh, its, its impact and evaluate uh, about uh, how this uh, kind of piece of work has impact in terms of improving the practice at the level of the primary care uh, facilities. Thanks again, Dr. Mona. Now we are going to move to the panel discussion and I will start with introduction of the panel member alphabetical. 
We have Dr. Mohamed Afifi, the reproductive health human, uh, sorry, humanitarian program specialist in the Arab States uh, Regional Office for United Nations Population Fund. And we have Dr. Nagwa Nashat, Assistant Professor of Family Medicine in Menofea University. And the last but not least, of course, we have Dr. Tomomi Kitumara, a child survival and development specialist in UNICEF Regional Office for the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the first question we received, if, uh, were, and it is directed to Dr. Tomomi, uh, how UNICEF has been involved in the development and the dissemination of the training widely? Over to you, Dr. Tomomi, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hassan, for this question. So I think um, we have been very lucky. I mean, UNICEF has been very lucky to collaborate with WHO, UNFPA, Wonka, and other organizations with the different um, mandates and specialization. So for development of the course, I think we have been included from the very beginning of the start of the development. So this gave us a very good chance to feedback to which topics we would like to include in the course. And then also this gave us a chance to share the resources that the UNICEF has developed, mostly for children, babies, caregivers, and families. And so that these population are going to be missed from this course. And then it was a very good chance for us to learn the resources developed by other organizations. So it was, thank you so much. And I think I have been very lucky as being a part of the team from the beginning. And for dissemination of this course, um, while the WHO Emerald colleagues has been working on a very successful social media campaign and so on, I think UNICEF has tried to work um, on advocate this course using the UNICEF network. So actually starting out from our internal health and nutrition colleagues globally in UNICEF. So we have developed the story on our collaboration on this course and put the story in a newsletter, um, global, which is called a global health newsletter. It's distributed to bi-monthly to our health and nutrition colleagues globally. And then after we finished this story that we went on to develop another story for UNICEF global website, which is uh, open for external audience as well. We normally put like executive director's speech or like very important child rights issues and so on, but we managed to put that story there as well. And then actually with this advocacy that the UNICEF headquarters became very, uh, headquarters digital health colleagues so became very interested in our collaboration so that uh, we went on to kind of record this successful collaboration as an institutional memory. So I think another thanks goes to everyone in this team. And to facilitate and then also make it e easy for UNICEF colleagues to take this course, um, we have discussed with the HQ colleagues whether we could put this training or link this training in our in a UNICEF online training course called Agora, which is also um, open for external UNICEF colleagues as well. So uh, in order to do so, I think I have other doctor sites so much for technical issues and so on, which are not very my, uh, major, but I have to bother him because of the, uh, I'm such a novice in this field. And finally, I think the course was realized and the uh, Implementation of the course in Agora was realized in 2021, um, February. And, um, and then HQ again collaborated with us to upgrade this course. So they actually again put this uh, training course in another uh, newsletter for UNICEF colleagues. So, so that's the, um, so I guess that's the, our history the, of our journey together. And then I think I learned a lot from this collaboration and developing the course and dissemination of the course. Um, so I guess we, could, I really learned that the, our collaboration could go beyond the distance, time zones, and also languages. And so to serve our healthcare workers who are working on front line to serve our children, babies, caregivers, families, and everyone. So thank you again so much for having UNICEF as a partner. Over back to you, Dr. Hassan. Thanks a lot, Dr. Tumi. Thank you very much, really. It's wonderful, uh, really, opportunity working with you. Um, the second question is to Dr. Mohamed Afifi. And the question is, how is this joint collaboration contributed to universal access to reproductive health care? 
overview of Dr. Afifi, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Uh, really, truly and wholeheartedly, yes. I wish to thank you personally for this opportunity and for the overall collaboration. And similar to what Tumomi concluded with, this is a very good example of the interagency collaboration, uh, especially on SDG3, Sustainable Development Goal 3, that is focusing uh, on health and well-being. Uh, UNFPA is more concerned, of course, by nature of its mandate uh, with reproductive health and maternal health. And we have the universal health coverage of sexual and reproductive health as one of the SDG three indicators. And it is a core priority to UNFPA throughout the region that we are covering, the whole uh, Arab world. This is very important for us to work with all stakeholders. And we were very pleased that the WHO was leading this effort and brought together several UN agencies and also Wonka and other partners. So we can together build on the strengths of each organization and make sure that during the time of the crisis and the pandemic that we are reaching out to doctors in the field with the information that they need. So this course in particular, it helped us to reach out to those in the remote areas, the hard to reach areas, who are at the same time as primary healthcare doctors and as family doctors. They are providing COVID services and at the same time, they are the key health workforce cadre that is concerned with delivering reproductive health and maternal health in the remote areas. With this course and the module that we all work together on, it was a great opportunity because of the accessibility of the course, because it being possibly uh, taken on a mobile phone or on your laptop from anywhere if you have a internet connection, then it was a very good opportunity and refresher for the information of doctors in the field. And also in some cases, non-doctors uh, also took the course and they were benefiting much from the information that during the COVID was very difficult because we know that there was also a pandemic of information and it's difficult to find reliable information. This provided an opportunity that we as UNFPA reach out also to all stakeholders and partners with reliable information that is certified by WHO. And we build on the capacities of the different uh, institutions, the partner institutions to spread out the information while having the endorsement and the blessing of the regional directors. This added another layer of trustworthiness and reliability and strength to the message that we were delivering to ministries of health and to NGOs who are delivering services in the field to maintain the balance between providing COVID services at primary health care level and also providing reproductive and maternal health care that is needed during these difficult times. Uh, to conclude, again, truly this was a very good example of uh, interagency collaboration. I'm very honored to be personally part of it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan and the team for the leadership and for this beautiful and positive uh, collaboration. And we look forward to collaborating uh, together on other uh, similar endeavors of joint interest. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Avivi. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all our work with our primary care partners, UNICEF, UNFPA, and uh, the rest of the of the partners, I mean, developing, disseminating. And now we are presenting our work. And this is, this is unique, by the way. This is really unique. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, the last question is, uh, is to Dr. Nagwa Nash'at. And the question is, what areas, of course, in which Wonka uh, uh, particularly uh, contributed in developing it? Over to you, Dr. Nagwa, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, and thanks everyone in the panel for this opportunity, and thank you, Dr. Hassan, for taking this forward. Um, first of all, I would like to emphasize on the importance of that collaboration between all the interagencies, because this is simply uh, through this way we are sharing and learning, and this is the best way to build a resilience health system in order to achieve the universal health coverage. So we are all working together for development of a uh, unified goal. Um, Wonka is the World Organization of Family Doctor and uh, Wonka is always keen for the advocacy of the family medicine 
practice and dissemination in all the areas, in, including the remote areas. So uh, the, the UNCA contribution in that course, and allow me, I'm going to wear the hat of uh, Dr. Jinan Osta because she was our immediate post chair for the UNCA EMR, and she was the one who had planned uh, that course with you. So during the planning of that course, uh, there was a main issue, which is about primary healthcare and family physicians. Do we have a role with COVID-19 or not? So that was a very important question because uh, a lot of people have been thinking and this organization that COVID-19 is uh, a tertiary care and it doesn't have to do anything with the primary care. So that was an important question because family physicians have a dual function regarding the basic benefit health package services as well as COVID-19 in prevention and treatment. Also, another question was important to answer. We have uh, the basic health package services, including the antenatal care, the uh, non-communicable diseases. What is the future of that during the COVID era? It was important to assure to all the primary health care practitioners and family physicians that this is part of the job and it has to be taken care while the uprise of the COVID because these are um, uh, a deprived population right now that will not seek to, uh, to care and will not seek to go to the primary health care. So a big concern and a big uh, effort should be done by the family physician to make sure that these people are not disadvantaged or not taking the proper care while doing their own um, while doing their own visits, and also uh, one thing that was uh, was concern at that time it's about well-being, well-being of the family physicians, well-being of the well-being of the community. It was something with uncertainty pathway at that time, where the world is all living in uncertain space. And everyone was feeling what's going to happen. It was something that the first time the whole universe is witnessing it together. So it's very important. It was very important to emphasize on the importance of well being of the physicians toward themselves and toward the community they are living uh, in. And I think the final part where the WUNCA had contributed was in the dissemination of that course and endorsing it to all the family physicians around the world or around the Imbu region specifically, telling them that this is very important and this gives the credibility for the course from uh, all our um, learners and all our physicians in the region. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nagwa. Uh, we have a question. Uh... We are done now with the panel discussion and we have uh, just only one question from Dr. Marwa Ahmed and she is from Cairo University and the asking is about how could the Cairo University share or to work in, in, in this initiative? Uh, Dr. Nagwa, you are from Menefea University and Dr. Saeed from Cairo University. Both of you easily can answer this question. Over to you, Dr. Nagwa, if you would like to start with. I think um, uh, through endorsement of the course, um, through endorsement of the course for all the family physicians who are working, I, this, I think this is, could be a way of collaboration from my point of view. Um, others, uh, over to you, Dr. Sain. Yes, thank you. Dr. Said. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, and thank you, Dr. Marwa, for the question. And I think Cairo University is one of the greatest universities in Egypt. And uh, leading universities in each country has um, a very important role, like Dr. Nagwa mentioned, regarding endorsing the course. And I think most um, family medicine departments in universities in Egypt has taken a very important role regarding COVID care. So most of COVID clinics has been supervised in primary care or first contact with suspected COVID has been supervised by family medicine departments in our country. Uh, they did very uh, successful outreaching activities, um, searching for uh, community uh, cases in the community, as well as follow up of post COVID. And these clinical roles of universities uh, could be very uh, strongly backed up by evidence based information. We are in the era where myths and wrong information are prevailing, prevailing regarding the disease, regarding its prevention, regarding vaccines regarding everything. Uh, universities have a role in spreading the evidence-based information. And we provide here a ready free tool to be spread in each department of family medicine in universities. 
Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thanks a lot, Dr. Saeed, and thank you very much again, Dr. Nagwa. We still have a couple of minutes to end of this session, and I would like to close the session with a take home short messages from our distinguished speaker. We'll start with Dr. Tumumi. Dr. Tumumi, please, over to you. Okay, yeah, thank you so much again for the team members, and then I'm so honored to be one of them. And I think, uh, while I was thinking about this panels and so on, that they maybe they think that, that we need to change one old saying. So that we often say, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. But I guess for now, that I think we could change it to like, if we go together, we could even go faster and far. Over from my end. I like it really. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Anfifi, thank please. Over to you, Dr. Anfifi. I was thinking along the same line. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Dr. Hassan, honestly, this is about collaboration. Yeah. Uh, WHO could have gone uh, alone, uh, UNICEF alone, UNFPA, Wonka, all the different partners, they have their own strengths and they could have gone through this initiative, but it gives it an added value and more strengths and more weight and the ideas that come from the different perspectives of the organizations. This is a key strength that we hope we carry forward in the future with other initiatives. And also not only in this area, in other areas, collaboration always wins. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very much. By the way, we are going to present this as a case study on December 16 in the Regional Health Alliance as a successful case study for the collaboration for the primary service partners. Thank you very much, Dr. Ampif. It is always a wonderful um, opportunity working with you. Uh, Dr. Mona, please. Hey, hi. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity uh, for being here to, uh, today. So um, my message, I think uh, I would uh, encourage all uh, attendees uh, to, uh, to take the course because this is really a very good course that covers uh, you know, all areas related to, uh, to COVID-19 at the primary healthcare level. And I would uh, encourage also WHO, EMRO, and other, uh, other partners uh, to proceed with the additional, you know, with other uh, uh, such similar courses for other uh, healthcare professions, I think. So uh, the online experience uh, was proven to be uh, well received, especially with, uh, you know, with, uh, with the support from WHO and other partners, and also with, uh, with the points, with the CME points that were uh, uh, linked to that. So I think it's a, it's a good, um, you know, it's a good way uh, to improve the knowledge of, uh, of healthcare providers at the primary healthcare level in all the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kimona. Um, Dr. Said, please. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. And uh, Yanni, allow me to, to thank you personally, Dr. Hassan, for your leadership in this. Because I think uh, the main idea and the concept was Dr. Hassan's concept. Then we followed internally in WHO uh, MRO team, then this uh, massive collaboration, and I think this massive success. This course really made difference, I think, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And again, uh, to the idea of spreading correct evidence-based information in an era with lots of methods and wrong information. So uh, I think we, uh, uh, Yanni, uh, while Dr. Mona was interviewing me for this evaluation, uh, I was telling her that uh, every day while I'm, I'm following up this course and the growth of the participants, uh, I was asking myself, um, what are the good deeds I did in my life to work on a, such a course with such a huge number of participants? So it, it was a blessing uh, working on this project. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Said. Uh, of course, last but not least, uh, our colleague, Dr. Nagwa. Please, Dr. Nagwa. Um, my take home message will be the theme of the conference, which is together we own the future. And this is a true example that the interagency collaboration shows learning and sharing is the only way to build a strong, resilient health system to achieve our goal. So this is, is a true role model for, for taking it further, copying in other 
things and projects to, to achieve the, the UHC. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nego. By the way, I like the flowers uh, on your website. Really Thank nice you. one. <laughs> Thanks you. a lot, uh, our distinguished uh, uh, colleague for the panel. And uh, thanks again for the whole participants for attending the session on the Eastern Mediterranean Region Collaboration on the online training for the primary health care uh, on the primary health care in COVID-19. Now we are almost uh, three o'clock and uh, we are going to close our session. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.